Reduce, reuse, repurpose, and recycle. These words have been ingrained in our minds as we face the reality of our overflowing landfills. In an attempt to combat this issue, we've been encouraged to look for alternative uses for the physical materials around us. And these ideas have ranged from promoting the purchase of secondhand clothing, all the way to discovering new ways to repurpose plastic into bags, shoes, and clothes. And as a result, we've been able to implement several successful recycling strategies in many different fields. But what if we could apply these same principles to the pharmaceutical industry, particularly in the field of drug development? Currently, it takes over a decade and billions of dollars to bring a successful drug to the marketplace. Implementing these same recycling strategies would allow us to bypass a large portion of the time and cost associated with traditional drug development and ultimately allow us to get effective treatment to patients faster. I was first introduced to the idea of drug repurposing when I first started my research career and I joined a lab that was focused on developing a combination therapy for the treatment of pancreatic cancer. As our understanding of the human body has expanded, we've learned that it can be best described as an integrated network with continuous interactions both within and between organ systems. And as a result, we've shifted away from studying diseases as isolated standalone conditions and towards a more holistic approach involving the entire body. This interconnectedness of the body can be seen on the potential side effects list of any potential medication. A patient comes into the clinic with symptom A and is given drug A to treat symptom A. Except drug A causes side effects, beta F, and so now this patient has to take additional medication to treat these additional side effects. And this process can go on and on, oftentimes resulting in a patient taking a string of medication. Now, for me, studying pancreatic cancer, we know that it's a complex collection of diseases characterized by inflammation and the onset of diabetes. As a lab, we believe that we could take advantage of the interconnectedness of the body, and that if we developed what we call a drug cocktail, we'd be able to come up with an effective treatment for the disease. Through reviewing what was already out in the literature, some trial and error, and a little bit of luck, we were able to successfully narrow down our efforts into just three drugs. Success in basic cell studies, had us curious to try to translate our results to preclinical animal trials. And for me, this was an important, per important component during my research career, as it was the first time that I was able to see firsthand the direct benefit of research. I saw as the mice grew tumors, and then I watched as the tumors began to shrink following treatment. And we consistently achieved better results, that is, smaller tumor volumes in animals that received our drug cocktail, compared to those that received chemotherapy alone. Now, what was most amazing about our results is that our drug cocktail consisted of only repurposed drugs. And actually, you may already know some of these drugs, like aspirin, the anti-inflammatory you've either already used before or at least have in your medicine cabinets, metformin, the anti-diabetic drug, and Tamiflu, the antiviral drug often prescribed for the common flu. And although we were amazed that we were able to achieve such success with our repurposed drug cocktail, we still weren't exactly sure how or why we saw what we did. And this is something that's always puzzled me about the drug research field. We don't always know how drugs work. We don't know their complete mechanism of action from start to finish. Oftentimes, we just know that they do. And this is the case with Tylenol. Tylenol is one of the most widely used pain relievers in the world. And it might surprise you that we don't know its complete mechanism of action. We know that it does work, and it works well, and we keep taking it and pres keep prescribing it. Now, coming from a family of engineers, I have been wired to be curious and want to know how and why things work the way that they do. Consequently, I set out to figure out how the components of our drug cocktail worked, and more specifically, how they worked in their newly discovered anti-cancer roles. So aspirin, like I mentioned, was a crucial component of our drug cocktail, and although it's been reported to have some anti-cancer effects, we aren't really sure how or why beyond cancer being associated with inflammation and aspirin being an anti-inflammatory. But it was through a rather serendipitous accident in an experiment that revealed that aspirin was able to effectively shut down a critical cancer-promoting pathway. Further analysis revealed that we may in fact have found a new target and effect for one of the most widely available drugs in the market. And it was what I like to call this happy accident that highlighted the impact and importance of drug repurposing that became the reason I chose to continue my graduate studies. Now, the idea of drug repurposing isn't brand new. It's been around for years, and it's been gaining interest due to the time and cost associated with traditional drug development. Broadly, drug repurposing consists of two crucial components. The first is taking pre-existing knowledge or technology that's approved for use in one condition, 
And second is applying it to a new disease or condition. And this is based off of the idea of polypharmacology. And this is where one drug can have multiple targets or effects due to multiple mechanisms of action. And then, given the interconnectedness of the body, these targets can be further interacting, potentiating the effect of a given drug. And now, the process of figuring out which drugs can have these multiple effects or actions can vary, whether it's similarities in the disease or similarities in the drug structure. But most common are those happy accidents like mine, where by chance, a drug is found to have another effect. And this was exactly the case with sildenafil. Sildenafil was originally developed for the treatment of hypertension. But it was a happy accident that was occurring during clinical trials that revealed a rather interesting side effect. And this happy accident ended up being the persistent erections during clinical trials, which ultimately led to the repurposing into Viagra for the treatment of erectile dysfunction. But it doesn't stop there, because the same compound has been further repurposed under a different dosing schedule as Revatio for the treatment of pulmonary arterial hypertension. And even that doesn't stop there, because more recently, the same compound is currently being investigated for the treatment of certain types of cancers. Now, not all drugs that are successfully repurposed come from happy accidents during clinical trials. Some fail in their original condition. For example, thalidomide was originally developed for the treatment of morning sickness, but the occurrence of serious birth defects had it quickly withdrawn from the market. It wasn't until we had a more careful look at the chemical structure of the compound that we were able to show that it was an effective treatment for leprosy, and even more recently, it's been approved for the treatment of multiple myeloma. Now, when we talk about using repurposed drugs, we don't necessarily mean taking them in the same way, shape, or form as we have in the past. Oftentimes, the dose or the dosing schedule changes. And this is an idea that precedes the concept of drug repurposing and actually dates all the way back to the 16th century. It was Paracelsus, the father of toxicology, who said, all substances are poisons. There is none which is not a poison. The right dose differentiates a remedy from a poison. And this is why the idea of dose and dosing schedule is a crucial component of the complex drug discovery stage. And although this, idea, this process can be complicated, it can be divided into several steps or stages, the first being drug discovery. Drug discovery is where as many as 10,000 potential candidates are screened. Any promising candidates are then tested in preclinical animal studies, and they are monitored for potential effects or safety for testing in humans. The next step is the clinical phase, where promising drugs are tested in patients. And phase one trials, as many, um, the, the drug is tested in a healthy patient population. This is to ensure that the drug doesn't cause more harm than it does good. The FDA estimates that only about half of the drugs pass phase one studies. In phase two trials, the drug is tested in the target population and is monitored for any potential side effects. Only about, a half, only about a third of these drugs pass this phase two trial successfully. And finally, in phase three studies, the drug is tested in a larger target population to ensure that an optimal dosing schedule has been achieved. Only a quarter of drugs pass this phase successfully. This clinical portion takes on average seven years and results into just one or two potential candidates. These candidates are then sent to the FDA for potential review and hopeful approval. And this process alone can take two years. And even if a drug is granted FDA approval, there's still long-term following or monitoring or a phase four trial to ensure that there is safety in real-world use. Collectively, this drug discovery process adds to a staggering 12 years and over $2 billion. And this includes the cost of all the drugs that don't gain FDA approval. So given these daunting success rates, or high failure rates, high costs, and the slow pace of drug discovery, drug repurposing has become a more and more attractive alternative as it involves the use of de-risked compounds. So to put things into perspective, repurposed drugs gain approval in a shorter time span of three to seven years and at less than 60% of the cost of new drugs that enter the market. And this is because the preclinical and early clinical trials provide invaluable information on the toxicity and tolerability, which translates to a greater than 30% success rate for repurposed drugs compared to the less than 10% success rate of new drugs entering the clinical stage of development. But despite these promising numbers, drug repurposing is still associated with its own set of challenges. The first and potentially most important is a long-standing skepticism. People, particularly patients, can be reluctant or skeptical to believe that a drug, especially a generic drug, can do anything other than what they've believed it to do for years. It's important that we adopt a more open-minded approach to drug repurposing 
as patient education is a crucial component for therapy success. Two other bottlenecks associated with generic drug repurposing that seem to go hand in hand are financial incentive and intellectual property or patents. We're at the point where generic drug repurposing is considered to be in a state of purgatory. And this is likely due to the lack of financial incentive, which is a major driving force for getting a drug to the market. There is no current way for a pharmaceutical company to charge a higher price for a drug to treat a new condition, while patients can continue paying a lower price to treat the original condition. And this is likely why no generic drug has been repurposed without modification of its dose or its dosing schedule, both of which would provide patent protection. However, most of the repurposing uses for generic drugs have already been reported in the literature, and this public disclosure reduces patentability. And no patent means no profit, and no profit means no incentive. And even if a method of use patent can be secured for a new use for a generic drug, there still might not be any profit, especially if this drug is available for many manufacturers, as a physician can just as easily prescribe another manufacturer's drug. Until a payment system is implemented that allows a company to reasonably recover its investment on repurposing a generic drug, generic drug repurposing will not effectively take place in the pharmaceutical industry. Now, it's evident that these challenges can't be overcome by quick fixes and rather require a collaborative effort between the pharmaceutical industry and regulatory officials, but it's important that we don't let these challenges distract us from the main issue at hand and the main goal of healthcare, which is to get effective treatment to patients faster. Fortunately, though, we are moving in the right direction. We need to continue to push for preliminary findings of repurposed generic drugs into the clinic where they can continue to help people. And this is where advocacy groups, nonprofits, and foundations play a big role. This generated interest has pushed us further in the right direction, and we've come up with innovative ways to even further expedite this process. It's the breadth and depth of scientific knowledge available to us from preclinical and clinical trials in combination with technological advancements that now actually permit us to mine information. And in this way, we can engineer those happy accidents that match a generic drug to a new target, as opposed to only relying on the serendipitous process that it once was. So now you may be thinking how you can play a role in this. Well, in addition to this being a crash course on drug repurposing, I hope that this sparked your curiosity into the untapped potential of the drugs that we may already have in our medicine cabinets. Together with regulatory bodies, private companies, academic groups, and nonprofits, we can collectively assemble those puzzle pieces necessary to get the effective treatments to the patients that need them most. So instead of approaching drug discovery as each of us ripping a page from our notebooks and starting from scratch when something doesn't work, let's apply those same recycling principles and bring those pages together and effectively complete the puzzle of successful treatment of diseases. Thank you.